Academy Award winning song, Que Serra Serra, was originally the theme tune of The Man Who Knew Too Much, an Alfred Hitchcock thriller with Doris Day in another dramatic part, this time opposite James Stewart. Location filming was in London, still her second favourite place after Carmel, and North Africa. Working with Hitchcock on the streets of Marrakesh was quite a strain, with scenes often going on for 30 takes. I began to think that I was doing something wrong. And he never did come in and tell us anything. So I finally said to Jimmy, um, I'm feeling very nervous right now because I have a feeling that I'm, that I'm the one at fault. But he isn't telling me anything. Please help me because you've worked with Mr. Hitchcock so many times and you know him and I don't. And he looked at me and he said, Oh, we're fine. And I said, really? Well, who's, well, who's doing it? The horse? What? Well, who, what's the problem? Anyway, this went on the whole time that we were in North Africa. And I was upset. And so then I had decided that when we returned to Los Angeles, I wanted to have a long chat with Hitch. We were going back to do all the big scenes. And I thought, some of those scenes cannot be done 20, 30 times. That's impossible. But we worked everything out. We became very good friends. And he said something about, um, I don't direct if you don't need it, my dear. And, uh, and he said, uh, if you were doing something wrong, I would be right in there to tell you. Midnight Lace uh, is again set in London, although filmed in Hollywood. In this, you you break down almost throughout the picture. You're, you're on the verge of hysteria because of this mysterious voice that's harassing you. It looks as though you were completely shredded when making that film. I was. I wasn't sleeping at night. It was very difficult to sustain that because I had to just break down every day. And you know, it's, it's very interesting. One dries up. You just don't cry that much. You can't. But thank God. Thank God. I prayed a lot about that. Being very positive, I decided that I would have everything I needed. Tony. Yes. You do believe me, don't you? Jack Lemmon once said that you were a method actress who never went near the actor's studio. What a nice thing to say. I wanted to go to the actor's studio. Oh, God. Tony, help me. I can cry right now if you'd like me to. I don't fake it, but I have a lot of things that um, I can think about and I can cry like that. In the late 50s, you were offered quite a lot of parts that you felt were too permissive. Instead, you chose Teacher's Pet as a major project. Now, what attracted you to that? Clark Gable. Yeah, the um, teacher-student relationship is a very complex one. You, you, um, you have to be um, friendly and, and, and yet um, keep your distance at the same time. Otherwise, um, how would you ever... points the way to the romantic comedies. It's the story, it did in a way, didn't you know, it? Because it's the story of a career woman who loves what she's doing and who has to come to terms with a rather devious, aggressive man. A macho male. And Christopher, I would like to um, talk a little bit about Clark, if I could. He was anything but macho. He was the gentlest, dearest man. And very humble. It was wonderful to see after a take, he was like a little boy, and he would say to George Seaton, our director, George, uh, are you sure that I gave you what you wanted? Are you sure? And George would say, oh, Clark, it was very good. It was just right on. I'm happy to do it again, George. 
Just say the word. I want you to be happy with what I'm doing. That was lovely. I really liked him. Now you've heard of instant coffee. You've heard of instant tea. See here, you guys, just feast your eyes on little. Lady Van Doren said something really strange, I understand. In a book that she wrote? A recent memoirs. I, well, I did not read it. My houseman told me this, because he reads all these things, you know. And he said that she said that I was very uh, curt and very strange. You never spoke to her, she says. You cut her. Don't worry. She is really not well. Hey, she is talented. Yeah. This lady is making that up, and that's too bad. I feel sorry for her to say something like that. That is not true. I don't behave like that. No, there's a definite contrast in the script between the yeah. dumb blonde and the professional woman, the professor, which, which mm -hmm. is you. Was that deliberate, do you think, so that people could see how different your image was to the one that so many other actresses were playing at that time? Monroe or Jane Mansfield or maybe. But I'm not Laura. Marilyn Monroe. Sure. But I, they actually I'm built into the film that Jane comes. Mansfield. I couldn't possibly do that. Well, maybe I could. <laughs> yeah, maybe I could. No, I don't think so. You are what you are. Hold me tight and kiss me right. I'm yours tonight. My darling, possess me. With Pillow Talk in 1959 began the third and by far the most popular phase in Doris Day's career as she became number one box office star for five successive years. Co-produced by her husband, Marty Melcher, and the occasion of her one and only Oscar nomination, Pillow Talk with Rock Hudson is the Doris Day movie most people remember. Part Broadway-style romance, part bedroom comedy, it gave her the chance to play a sexy, sophisticated New Yorker for once. Was this a bit risky at the time? It seemed risque, but isn't it funny when you think what they're showing now? Oh, I was crazy about that script. And uh, I loved the clothes, and I loved working with Rock the first time. He was the one who was worried. Look, I don't know what's bothering you, but don't take your bedroom problems out on me. I have no bedroom problems. There's nothing in my bedroom that bothers me. Oh, oh well, that's too bad. He had never played comedy, and he wasn't sure that he could, and uh, we all assured him that uh, he would be wonderful in it, and he was. We had a great time. There's a sequence in Pillow Talk where uh, Rock Hudson sweeps you off your feet, walks down the steps into the street, uh, you're wearing pajamas at yeah. the time. I gather that sequence caused some problems. Well, he had a bad back, and he said, um, I said, well, now, look, I don't weigh that much. And it wasn't that. He just, uh, he couldn't, you know, support me without having s some help. So they made a seat. You didn't know about that. See, we hid that with the blanket. Harry, would you be so kind as to call the police? It had straps that went over his shoulders, under his jacket, which uh, supported him and supported me, really. And so it worked very well. And I said, oh, great, all the women in the audience are going to think, oh, isn't he a he-man? <laughs> I'm going to tell them all. I'm sorry I made you drive so far out. Such a lonely stretch of beach. Oh, that's all right. Realize you shouldn't be embarrassed to have people see you like that. Uh, well, I, I... No, you look wonderful without your clothes. So do you. The screen partnership with Rock Hudson is one of the aspects of your career that everybody remembers. It's the real high point of your, of your movie career. What was the chemistry there? Did you get on very well as people? Yes, we did. Oh, we were very good friends. And yet I didn't uh, see Rock often socially. He had his own friends, and, um, and we were, you know, usually socializing with married couples and... Um, but that didn't make any difference. He and I were very good friends. We loved working together. We respected each other. And um, I think that that came across. There's one rather uncomfortable thing watching them. There's quite a lot of gags about gay men in the films, about, you know, the number one male star. Uh, in Pillow Talk, you know, there was. Pillow Talk, exactly. Was that tense 
for Rob Hudson to do? I don't think so. I didn't uh, see it as such. Um, nothing was ever talked about as far as his private life. And uh, I must tell you that many, many people would ask me, you know, is Rock Hudson really gay? And I said, it's something that I will not discuss. I mean, uh, first of all, I know nothing about his private life. And if I did, I wouldn't discuss it. So I can't tell you one thing about him except that he is a nice man. A lot of commentators have said that Pillow Talk and the films that immediately followed are about a perpetual virgin protecting her honour. Actually, I don't see them like that at all. They're, they're like a sort no. of an adult woman protecting her space, you know, protecting no. sort of an adult woman protecting her space, you know, protecting her integrity. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why people landed that label on them at the time. Well, it gives them something to talk about, and it gives it a label, and that's what they like.